Science connects the complexity of life, from the basic building blocks at a microscopic level to massively interacting populations. It guides public policy. It addresses the pressing challenges to human health, habitat, and well-being. The biocomplexity approach encompasses multiple disciplines, experiential learning, and looks at science as it exists and interacts in the world. Science connects researchers, highlights collaborations, and helps solve issues that face our lives today. Hello all, I'm Becky Framall with the Biocomplexity Institute of Virginia Tech. The topic of discussion today, how science connects with life and quite honestly within itself between the different disciplines. Now it's a concept of biocomplexity that everything is connected. You can't really address an issue in its silo without looking, of course, at the bigger picture and how it's connected to other issues. The importance of pollinators fits perfectly into this concept. And I can tell you that bees, for example, their hives, how they pollinate, how they show the connections between bees within the hive as well as outside in nature, the need for pollination, and how their work in nature connects to human life. It's a lot of complexity to bees. Uh, so with me to break it all down, because I am not your beekeeping expert, but James Wilson, an instructor at Virginia Tech and teaches a beekeeping class here on campus, as well as Richard Reed, also joining us, former president of the New River Valley Beekeepers Association and currently owns his own hives. Um, but without further ado, uh, James and Richard, first of all, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank Glad you. to be here. Um, Thanks. Absolutely. James, let's go with you first. Give us a, give everyone a little, go a little bit more in the weeds than what I just did. Tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So uh, my title here at Virginia Tech is I'm the Extension Apiculturist. That means that 60% of my job, I work with beekeepers like Richard and growers and people throughout the state to uh, bring the science from our university out into the public and help it be applied out there. And then 40% of the time I teach, I have two classes I teach here on campus, one on bees and beekeeping, the other in insects and human society. And my background is I did my master's and my PhD here at Virginia Tech, and I did my bachelor's in fisheries and wildlife science, and that's where I first fell in love with insects and minored in entomology. Very cool. Richard, uh, beekeeper still and former president of the New River Valley Beekeepers Association, correct? Yes. Um, I started keeping bees uh, quite a long time ago, it seems now, in 1971, and uh, we didn't have too many problems back then, kept bees through the mid 90s and gave it up for a little while. But 10 years ago, I started back and uh, it's been a more intensive process than the prior 20 some years. Uh, fascinating though. So tell me, it uh, leads me to one of the questions I have right off the bat. Why keep bees? For me, it's, it's they're just incredible critters. They, <laughs> they really are fascinating. It's very complex, their society is, and um, honey. There's working with the biology of the bee. So one of the things I do is queen rearing, and I sell bees to other beekeepers. So to put all that together along with producing honey, you have to uh, work with the biology of the bee. And, and like I said, it's, it's complex, but fascinating. So I really enjoy that. You know, uh, James, a question for you too. Why would, as an instructor, why is it that you um, kind of, you're a pusher, push this on people. Why are you teaching this class? Why are you telling people like Richard and others, hey, you know what, beekeeping is a good thing. This is something you can do in your backyard and this is why you should do it. Sure, so an easy sell is to talk about the impact that it can have on our diet. And as a fairly developed country, we definitely have a great diversity of foods in our diet and it helps us you know, get all the natural antioxidants and things like that that we want. And we can't do that without insect pollinated fruits and vegetables and nuts and things like that. So that's a very easy take home. Okay. Whereas the rest of the world and more of the developing countries, they're more of the caloric staple getting into just carbohydrates and things like that. And those aren't as necessary, uh, necessarily uh, pollinated by insects. So that's a real easy take home. But then on top of that, yeah, it's a tremendous challenge, but it's a lot of fun. And uh, personally, I get a little research crush when I work <laughs> with bees. It's not like, you know, a group of stink bugs hiding out in a corner kind of thing. It's a whole society that can adapt and can uh, overcome you if you're not careful. And so uh, it's, it's a lot of fun when it does work right. Um, what kind of bees? And I'll start with you on this one, James, um, especially maybe for a new person who's trying this out, opposed to someone like Richard who has experience. 
uh, might be listening and saying, you know, I would love to try this out. But, you know, they both just said this could be a little complex. <laughs> um, well, how, how, is there a starter kit B that you can start with or is there a B that's preferred that you do? So when we're talking about beekeeping, yeah. we're talking about the honey bee specifically. And so we mean Apis mellifera. So that's going to be just one type of bee. But okay. there are other bees, even in other bee families, that we can interact with very easily. So if you're looking for something along the lines of, I want to watch birds, so I have a bird feeder, you can do things like have solitary nesting bees that you can put a little group of uh, stems and things like that where these bees will nest and you can observe them and learn from them and then get the pollinator benefit from there, like mason bees and leafcutter bees and, and the like. But if you actually want to get into the culturing of bees, keeping these, getting into animal husbandry and being actively involved with the biology and their products, that's where we would get into the honeybee. Okay, I'm going to ask a question because I feel like a little beekeeper right now. We actually took a four by four piece of wood, sawed it in about, I don't know, 12 inch blocks and foot blocks, drilled a bunch of holes in it because a friend of ours told us to do that and smoked the wood. So we did because my beekeeping friend in Cleveland, Ohio. So I put it in the back of my yard because I have two boys and I thought this could be a bad experiment. Um, the bees left them alone and all those little holes sealed up and we had mason bees. But I have to admit, I have no idea why we did that. <laughs> what is the bonus? Why did I do that? You did that because you're curious. I was. But did it help anything? Is there a reason people should do that? Uh, yes and no. So the, the first and foremost reason is for awareness. So people have an idea of what those bees do, their impact, and how they behave. Mm -hmm. uh, without that, we can just ignore it and not be any closer to the source of our food. And so those bees perform their own pollinating tasks, whether it's specifically for our gardens, our vegetables, or on a larger scale, things like alfalfa, that's a different kind of bee for there. Oh, okay. uh, being that much closer to it really helps bring it home and, and add value to us to what is otherwise a, an ecosystem service that's very difficult to calculate. And Richard, you're out there, you know, you call it sideliners. I called it a side hustle, but I guess sideliners is actually a real name. Um, talk about what sideliner means and what do you see from fellow beekeepers like yourself? What they do, the bees they keep, do they do that kind of intermixing between honeybees and mason bees? Um, I think that's two different things. I was going to tell you, I just so, asked you 10 questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, in the bee world, you have generally three categories of beekeepers, hobbyists, and that goes up to a certain number of colonies, maybe 20 some colonies, and you're generally doing it part very much as a part-time hobby. And um, you have sideliners who are making some money from the bees or doing something that actually uh, is, is economically productive from them. And that might go up to a few hundred hives, depending on the situation. And then you have commercial beekeepers. And the typical picture of that would be your very large beekeepers with 500 to up to 70,000 colonies. Oh my gosh. Yeah, the largest beekeeper in the country. Uh, and they all generally are migratory. So they are going to take their bees on tractor trailers or flatbed trucks all over the country, even as far as from the East Coast to Central Valley of California for almond pollination in February. And from there to all the other, other uh, crops that they're pollinating. So that, that truly is agribusiness and, and commercial beekeeping. It's certainly possible to have a business from beekeeping mm -hmm. and have between say 15 and and a uh, couple of hundred hives. That kind of leads right into my question of talking about kind of the ecosystem when you said they're traveling from I don't know what it be place to place to pollinate the almonds what is almond trees or whatever in California. Why are these bees so important to almonds? Almonds are not self-pollinating. They require cross-pollination and it is a huge crop. Um, the almond crop in the U.S. is uh, the largest pollinated crop in the world. Uh, that's also the largest source of almonds in the world. And it requires bees. They've been working on self-pollinating varieties, but they are not there yet. Hmm. So you have somewhere to the tune of uh, 1.75 million uh, colonies going to California in February every year to get that crop pollinated. Dude. Do they not have enough bees of their own that someone actually has to drive a flatbed truck or a semi in? To... Generally, the farmers 
don't have their own bees. And gotcha. so beekeepers oh, bring okay. them. There is one large company that did acquire some bees uh, several years ago from a large beekeeper. But I don't think that's the rule. I guess I would think being not a beekeeper and understanding all of the ins and outs, I guess I just thought there were enough bees in nature to do this, that you didn't actually need to bring bees in. So worldwide, yes, botanically, there are enough bees to pollinate those plants for whatever they would need to continue on to be a species. When we ask more of them in terms of yield than just their reproductive capability, we need to add in pollinators. And the number one pollinator that's added in worldwide is, is the honeybee. And so it, it has a fantastic advantage in that it's an inundative pollinator. We can just drop a box down and have them go to work. And that's, that's fantastic. In a lot of these agricultural systems, we're talking about a very limited window of bloom. Mm-hmm. So then otherwise, there's no advantage agriculturally or economically to have anything else that those bees would be able to feed off of. So it's not going to be a hospitable place for bees most of the year. So explain, too, their connection to the ecosystem as well as their connection, which almost kind of obvious through this almond example to people why we should even if I don't want to keep bees myself why I should care that there are people like you in the world who are making sure that they stay alive and prosper well it's uh it's a little bit of an in-between my guilty thing is being a nerd about it is that <laughs> uh they're not our bees these are actually the European honey breeds that we brought over when we settled and so uh, ecosystem service wise we don't need these bees but gotcha. agriculturally if we were going to eat we do need these bees so if we had no bees, what would not grow? Outside of almonds, obviously. Well, there would be all kinds of things. There's other types of pollinators that are native. Um, there's there's flies, there's ants, there's beetles. And actually, when we when we saw the evolution of, of blooming plants and flowering plants, we saw a tremendous diversity of insects on top of that. They're able to take advantage of that. So they're already there. We have our own bees here, but they're different bees. We don't have honeybees here. We brought the honeybees. So we've got bumblebees, sweat bees, leafcutter bees, on and on and on and on. We have over 4,000 different Four. species of bee here in North America. Yeah. The European honeybee is one species. So, Richard, what do you see with beehive? I mean, I guess they're all honeybee keepers, yes? Yes. Uh, actually, in North America, as you get down south, uh, Actually, you'd have to go into Central America and South America. Some people actually do keep stingless bees, which is a different species of of bee. (laughs) And they're small. They do bite, uh, but it's not the same as a bee sting. And they produce small quantities of honey. That's one other type of bee that is kept in the world. Um, In Asia, you also have Apis serrana, which is kept as a honey bee by beekeepers as well. But I think by far, like James said, Apis mellifera is the Western European honey bee, and that's the one most everybody keeps. So talk, and this will be a question for both of you, you from teaching a class on Virginia Tech's campus and you from being a sideliner in, in, in out in the world, what do you hear, and I'll start um, with you, Richard, from people who either A, want to get involved in beekeeping or those who are already well into it? What is what is the attraction and what is the, expe- especially the excitement for the new people who are learning things as they go? Uh, I think that's a hard question to answer specifically because because everybody has a different reason. But I think generally bees are in the news. And besides being fascinating and being something you can be involved with that kind of connects you to the the world as a whole, a lot of people want to save the bee. Actually, Western European honeybees, Apis mellifera, probably don't need saving because beekeepers tend to do a pretty decent job of building their numbers back again. There are other things I think you can do to help save the bee. And when you talk about saving the bee, it's more generally about saving all the bees. Like James said, there's about 4,000 species of bees in North America, uh, anywhere from 12 to 20,000, depending on the source in the world. There's a huge number of bees Nearly all of them, except these few honeybees, are solitary bees, native bees to different areas. Uh, So people are interested in doing something to help the environment, and I think that drives a lot of the, the interest. 
You know, and I'm going to ask you that question, but add to it um, the importance. I'm going to make a you're, separate question. Yeah, I was just oh, going to say, yeah. you're the uh, instructor, so I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> you do this to your students, we're going to return the favor. Uh, but seriously, talking about the environment, why it is so important for the environment, kind of an A-B question. A, what do you hear from students that come and take your class? Why are they interested? Um, and in long, those, what did you say, Richard? That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> um, why, you know, why your students are interested and, and why, uh, when it comes to that environmental side, what, what is the impact environmentally? So let's start with A. Sure. Uh, <laughs> not that I'm taking notes and keeping track of that. So at the beginning of every semester, I teach bees and beekeeping, which is in the spring semesters because it's a lot more fun to talk about bees when the bees are growing instead of when the bees are declining. <clears throat> um, I always ask these students, and there are no requirements to take my class. So anybody can walk in from any college, any discipline, and I end up with a tremendous diversity of it. So uh, the, the architects, they're interested in the architecture of the bees because they know that this society of insects can make and construct their own nest and do so with such purpose that they can be very successful in it. Huh. Then they can get up and they can decide to move in something like a swarm and start all over again. So then the biologist is interested in that behavior of how they can go back and they don't, they might not entirely realize this, but they, how that swarm can get up and, and start all of those jobs and tasks all over again and then be a functioning society within a week. Things like that. Whereas, uh, you know, the, the people who are into horticulture, they like plants, plants flower, they like bees. That's sort of a, a very <laughs> short thing. Or we'll end up with people with an uh, in animal and poultry science. Mm -hmm. This is livestock. We're talking about herd dynamics. We're talking about the same disease issues, same types of prescriptions, and things like that that we need to think about in, in larger scale food supply. And then uh, otherwise, we end up with people that, yeah, I want to save the bees. I want to do something about it, or at least learn something about it. Or uh, frankly, a lot of students get stung. <laughs> I surveyed my, my uh, Insects and Human <laughs> Society class, trying to talk about the impact of insects, and said, okay, fine. You guys may not know about the impact of insects yet. How many of you have been bitten or stung by an insect? And they reluctantly, everybody raised their hand. Yes, of course they have. Yeah. But it's something that they remember. Um, and so they all have their own interest in it. And so I bribe them every day to come back by giving them a, a different honey, even if it is Richard's honey one day or, you know, one I pick up at a truck stop <laughs> the next. You know, for those who say, oh, I want to save the environment, they might be hearing right now, oh, we don't have to save the bees. All right, well, so never mind. This is the most visible example. And we can, we can buy these, we can trade these, we can manipulate these. What we can't do is we can't figure out the specialist bee that we haven't even discovered yet that definitely occurs here. There's only 500 and approximately 36 uh, known species of bee to occur in Virginia. I can tell you we haven't discovered them all. That's just what we happen to have a museum sample of. Oh, cool. So we can get into something so specialized. So if we think about the honeybee, it's a generalist. It finds a flower. It either gets nectar or pollen or both from it. It likes it. It's going to exploit that. It's going to recruit to it, and they're going to take advantage of it. That can happen on just about anything that's tolerable to them. If it has an adequate reward, they'll go and feed from it. The squash bee, you never guess what it likes. Squash. And so it's going to go in. It's going to be a better pollinator at that. It's going to uh, be more adapted for it. It's actually not there for the nectar. It might feed on the nectar a little bit for fuel. It's only there for the pollen. It's a different nesting strategy. It's going to go make a ball of pollen out of the pollen it gets from a squash or cucumber or a pumpkin, lay one egg in it, and start all over again. So then it's a much different impact as far as pollination goes. That's just one example of the diversity of the life cycle of those two bees and then how there's one that's entirely specialized and one that's not specialized at all. So it, for us, it's very translatable to talk about the reward of honey, to talk about the reward of immediate pollination services, especially when we have agricultural examples we can use all over the place when we're talking about the honeybee. When we get into the more complex things of who pollinates the flame azalea up at Mountain Lake, it turns out that it's not even a bee at all. Oh, really? The flower structure has nothing to do with it. It's actually our state insect, the tiger swallowtail. I did but, not know we had a state inst insect. Oh, well, we do. It's we a, could go on a whole is, other half hour, but I'll, I'll keep it. It is, of course, <laughs> the first uh, described insect from North America. Very cool. Yeah. So, it, so for us, we use this as a, a parallel or an example of how we can talk about the pollinator issue in general. Right. And how we can talk about pollination and how we can talk about ecosystem services in a very deliverable and manageable package. So from there, we jump into the honeybees because that's a, a starting point. And that's where we can think and relate to it and manage it. And, and what's good for honeybees is also good for the native bees generally. So oh, okay. if, you're doing, if you're doing something that's going to help the honeybee, all the other bees, if you're creating an environment that's good, good for them, you're going to create an environment that's good for native bees. So we talk about like an umbrella effect. 
Yeah. To where they'll fall under that umbrella. Um, which kind of leads me to something that I thought was interesting, Richard, when you were talking about an example that you don't even have to be a beekeeper to do this, but just to let a small section of your yard grow, just do its thing. When you start talking about the problems that bees face, uh, I think what you're looking at from a beekeeper's perspective is is number one is probably parasites, and we haven't talked about this yet, but varroa mites are a big, big challenge for honeybees. And so they have to be managed some way. Then I would say next on the, on the list, at least in our area, because we're not in a huge agricultural area here, is forage. Uh, I have seen from talking to other beekeepers and just traveling around that you go to areas that are more affluent and you're going to have more control of the environment, even outside of the towns. Uh, people have tractors and they have mowers and they control weeds. And it's pretty extensive if you have acreage and you feel like it all needs to look like a golf course. Because what you've done is you have taken away uh, an environment that is good for all these native bees we were just talking about and good for honeybees as well. So I, w I would suggest to, to anybody that has land or a yard, leave part of that, just leave part of it to, to grow up in weeds. Weeds are, should not be looked at as a negative, uh, that should not be looked at as a negative term. Um, weeds generally include many flowers and that's good for the butterflies, all the native bees we talked about, honeybees, all of those. And it's pretty fascinating when you start watching. You know, and James, just to kind of top off on that, I, I, I feel like in talking to the two of you, it seems like when you talk about complexity and how science connects and how it all is interchangeable and really very interconnected, uh, the bees have got this figured out and we're, we humans are like light years behind them. <laughs> Your thoughts on that and, and bees and their complexity? Sure. Well, uh, they do. They they have evolved <laughs> evolved with those plants. Uh, that's that's it. Like they, they exploit it. They, the plants were successful. The bees were successful. And then from there, it's just an arms race of how much reward it takes to continue to be pollinated. And then how effective they are pollinating it. And then we get into all kinds of crazy attractants. What we see as flowers isn't at all what the insects see as flowers. You can flip on, you know, the, the UV spectrum and you can see there's giant nectar guides that have signs that say, eat at Joe's kind of thing, going <laughs> to where the, the nectaries are and guiding these bees. And that's got to be a, such a high evolutionary cost, it has to be worth it. And so before we even showed up, it was there and it right. was in place and it was successful and it was driving success. And yeah, it's, it's impressive. And even when we talk about, okay, let's just get into the keeping the bees. The best thing we can do when we're at the top of our job and what we're doing is we're anticipating the needs of the colony. And as soon as we don't, then we are catching up with the bees. And that can, the biggest time that, that is evident is in the spring when they're doing their build up and they're looking at swarming. We're trying to stay all on top of it to make sure we're not losing bees or losing, losing stock or just trying to make sure we have enough equipment rolling around to keep things going and take advantage of what we can. Gotcha. So before we wrap up, um, Richard, talk a little bit. Um, I want to kind of give you, let you give a plug, so to speak, for the New River Valley Beekeeping Association. If anyone's interested, what do they need to know? Yeah, the New River Valley Beekeepers Association uh, includes an area that's probably four or five counties uh, around Montgomery County and Blacksburg. Uh, we have members coming from Roanoke, um, Pulaski, Giles, uh, Floyd. Uh, as well as our area. Um, we teach beginning beekeeping classes every spring. We have speakers like James uh, every month at our meetings, and the purpose of that is to educate beekeepers and help them. We generally have mentors available for people who do start beekeeping so that we can help them be successful. Uh, we have a, an apiary that we do some teaching at, so we have some hives, and we generally have field days there uh, during the season. Um, so you can, you can find out more information on the New River Valley Beekeepers Association Facebook page or at the website, which is nrvba.org. Okay. 
Perfect. And um, a plug for Virginia Tech, it sounds like if people want to get involved, they can take a class here. And you have, what is the Beekeepers at Virginia Tech Club? Is it a club? That's right. So the undergraduate students started their own uh, actual club, uh, registered club as it, as it is, with uh, known as the Beekeepers at Virginia Tech. And, uh, yeah, they're all excited. A lot of them have taken my class. A lot of them haven't. And so it's kind of neat to see how they can uh, attract somebody who would be interested that might not have the opportunity to take my class. But, yes, I teach a class. It's uh, bees and beekeeping, and we have a lecture component and a lab component. And the lab is almost always full because um, there's only so many colonies I can let brand-new beekeepers get into right as they're building up. But it's a, it's a great deal of experience. And, and actually, I'd like to untouch, touch on what Richard was talking about. There are organizations like Richard's throughout the state. And then on top of that, there's the Virginia State Beekeepers Association. It's sort of a central entity that it meets a couple times a year and tries to bring all those members in for uh, a more concentrated effort. And then there are regional ones like that. So uh, the great successes of those programs are that there are there is mentoring. That there's the opportunity for you to go out with limited to no cost and get experience in bees and try it out, or at least learn something about it. And, and a lot of these clubs, they might not mention it, they do a tremendous amount of outreach. So New River Valley Beekeepers Association has been working with uh, our bug fest that we started years ago. Yep, and um, <laughs> it's been helping out ever since. And uh, it's, it's had a tremendous impact and really given a nice public face to, to bees. So much so that when I started doing my own thing with it, I had to make sure I wasn't stepping on the <laughs> <laughs> because they were so successful at it. All right. Well, very cool. Again, I'm Becky Freeman with the Biocomplexity Institute of Virginia Tech. With me, James Wilson and Richard Reed. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. I Thanks. really appreciate it. Uh, all of us out here breaking down the complexity of bees. And it is amazing, amazing to me how science connects. Sharing knowledge accelerates discovery. To learn about other transdisciplinary collaborations, go to bi.vt.edu. The Biocomplexity Institute of Virginia Tech revolutionizes information biology, personalizes healthcare, and develops new tools to accelerate the pace of scientific discovery.